stop. I don't know if any of you guys are having that problem, but you know, I have three kids. My three kids are now at home uh, doing school, as all kids are. Their teacher is just great. Big fan of his. Love him. Uh, it's me. And uh, we are, I think my biggest assignment every day is being in charge of the IT failures of the internet and trying to get the kids back onto their classes. It's a pain in the keister. So, um, so I'm at my office. I'm at, the, I'm at uh, uh, KOC HQ, which is why you can see, whoops, wrong side, right, right there, that, that's a drawing of Robin Rich that's on the uh, screen of the Golden Tea Machine that we used in Kings of Con. Because rather than rent a Golden Tea Machine, we bought a Golden Tea Machine. And it's here in our office. And then over here, right there, hold on, getting adjusting to pointing in reverse, right there. This is a blanket given to me by Trish and Frida. Trish, that's the wrong way. Trish, Trish, right there. Trish is the head of the makeup department for Supernatural. And Frida, who is the second person in charge of the makeup department at Supernatural, both of whom are good friends of mine. And they stole my camera uh, back when I was actually acting on the show. This goes back to Gabriel's last run. So, I don't know. Season, was that season 13? And uh, they took my camera and they took a bunch of photos that I discovered when I got the camera back. And this is, um, one of the photos they took was both of themselves looking down at the camera uh, and the sky was completely white behind them. So it became this amazing, just solid white background of just Trish and Frida, Frida's face staring down at the viewer. And uh, it's my favorite photo of all time, and I'm including photos of my children. This is my favorite. And uh, I then turned it into uh, posters that I sent to them. I turned it into mugs that I sent to them, shot glasses, notepads, uh, hats. And every time I would come up, I'd bring a, a different piece of Trish and Frida swag. I really think it's the brand that we're going to go with, Trish and Frida. And it's going to be it's going to be lights out. It's going to be a big deal. Anyway, that's our brand. That's our logo. And they, in return for all the swag I got them, uh, they got me a blanket made of that photo. And they got me a blanket, and they presented it to me on stage. Well, they, they weren't there. They gave it to Jensen Ackles to bring to uh, a convention, and he gave it to me live and on, on the stage. And it was, uh, it was a moment. It surprised the crap out of me. Anytime Jared and Jensen keep you on stage, don't let you leave stage and say, hold on, we have something for you. Be afraid. Be very afraid. I certainly was. But what I got was this blanket. So with that, it's covering a big black monitor that's just like a big um, monolith of darkness, and it was not attractive behind me. So I put Trish and Frida up on the screen. Ladies and gentlemen, Trish and Frida. Robin Rich and Trish and Frida. And Golden Tea. And Bullet with Steve McQueen. Um, all right, listen, I don't exactly know how uh, this all works in terms of taking questions, but I think I can take questions. I think I can do that kind of thing. So, um, all right, when I'm, I'm getting texts from creation people also with uh, information on questions because it's kind of hard to follow the questions on the, uh, on the side screen here because they go quickly. I know a lot of the musicians in the in the group have done these stages before. Jason Manns, Billy Moran, Brianna Buckmaster, Rob Benedict, the entire Loudon Swain ensemble, Stephen Norton, Michael Borja. But uh, I never have. So this is the first. And it's not even, I'm not even doing a musical thing. It's, it's just, just me, me talking. Um, so uh, one of the text questions I got. Somebody asked uh, about the podcast. Do you guys know that Rob Benedict and I started doing a podcast? Raise your hand. Oh, cool. A lot of you. A um, couple in the back seem out to lunch, but the rest of you know that Rob Benedict and I started doing a podcast. It is available on something called Anchor. It's also available on iTunes, which is the easiest place to get it probably. Um, 
It is called, and my guest is Richard Spate. It is a podcast born out of the need uh, for two guys who are uh, itching to do something fun and entertaining, but hamstrung by the virus and the orders of the day. Uh, this is what we came up with. It's uh, our, our way of sort of catching up with each other, catching up with the situation, bantering back and forth and having fun while also keeping connected with the outside world. And so it's, it's become really, really fun. We have done four episodes. Um, and I, I hope you guys are enjoying it. I hope you guys who know about it enjoy it. I hope you guys who don't know about it will now know about it and go find it and enjoy it. Um, because it's awesome. It's really, really fun. Uh, and it's basically Rob Benedict's... Uh, we both record it separately. I'm in my house. He's at his house. And we, you know, we're talking at the same time, but we're recording separate tracks. I send him the track, and then Rob marries the tracks together and then lays in all these cool sound effects and songs and stuff that he does. And he's the engineer of the whole thing. And it's, it's really, really funny. Some of, the, some of my favorite parts are when I go back and listen to whatever song Rob put in as the bumper for that bit, like, you know, Robin Rich's entertainment suggestion box or whatever the hell. We we're making it up on the on the fly, so I can't remember anything we say. But we say stuff, and we're like, oh, that should be a, there should be a musical hit here. Rob, make a musical hit. And then, sure enough, when he goes back to edit it, he puts in a musical hit, and it's hilarious. So somebody asked how long we're going to keep doing that podcast. Our intent is to keep doing it as long as possible. We're having a good time with it. We're definitely doing it all the way through quarantine, which is, uh, well, we don't know, right, do we? But it'll be a while. We're all going to be in this for a while. So we'll be doing it for a long time in that regard. Uh, and then probably if, if we get our sea legs and we're digging what we're doing, we'll probably keep going after the quarantine because it's really fun. And now that we're getting the technical side of it down and getting comfortable with it, we will uh, probably keep it going because it's fun for us and hopefully fun for you. And if you don't know about it, again, check it out. It is called And My Guest is Richard Spate. And it is on iTunes, Arrow, or wherever you find your quality podcasts. Uh, all right, next question. Uh, let's see. Oh, I'm supposed, to say, I'm supposed to say the screen. Okay, I'm supposed to say the screen name of the person who asked the question. I just got yelled at. A text, man, Brittany has clearly been drinking. It, um, that, that question was from Loudon Swain fan, which really could be anybody, because everybody's a Loudon Swain fan. Um, Let's see. By the way, you guys want a, a quick... Uh, oh, somebody asked if we're going to do a, a music tour in the UK. I hope so. I, mean, I don't know if you guys know this. Uh, I started a band. We released a record. The band is called Dick Jr. and the Volunteers. Um, we released a record called The Dance and How to Do It. And uh, I think I don't have any of the CDs in here because they're all at my house. Well, that blows. Um, but, uh, yeah, did a band, did a band, did, did, the album's called The Dance and How to Do It, Dick Jr. and the Volunteers, available on iTunes, available on Amazon, available on, uh, Spotify, uh, it's just available, and it's fun. Jason Mann's produced it, it's got a lot of the usual suspects that you know and love if you are a fan of the music created by this family, uh, it's got Coop on the bass, it's got Humphreys on the drums, uh, it's got Newcomer. Zachary Ross on guitar, who's a freaking phenom. Got Billy Moran on guitar. Got Emma Fitzpatrick on vocals, and she also uh, co-wrote one of the songs. Um, it's great, whole fun musical effort. Rob Benedict wrote a song and sings on the song that he wrote. So it's, it's been a blast, and I want you guys to check it out if you haven't. So will we ever play in the UK? Man, that, that is what we are hoping to play in the UK. You know, Monday, this Monday, we were going to be doing a show in Nashville. We got, you know, this was the convention in Nashville, which is my hometown, and we were going to be doing a concert on Monday at a place called the Exit Inn. It was originally going to be at the Basement East, the Basement East, a fantastic music venue, and a tornado came through town, through Nashville, and gutted that place, and I'm so sorry about that, and I hope those, those folks are able to, to rebuild and everybody's able to get back on their feet, but no sooner did that tornado, you know, destroy that place and suddenly we had a, a virus destroy everything else. So 
after Basement East, we were going to move the venue, move the show over to the Exit Inn. Exit Inn is a bar um, that I've been going to since I was able to go to bars. It's, a, it's where you go see bands play. And I went to see everybody that I was a big fan of back in my youth, uh, including um, Walk the West. And Walk the West is the band that originally wrote and recorded Living at Night, which I cover on my record. So I saw them there in the 80s twice. Uh, anyway, it's a great venue, and I'm sorry we didn't get to play a show there, but I'm hoping that we, we will get to play a show there. So I want to play the UK. I want to play Nashville. I want to play Atlanta. I want to play New York. I want to play. I want to play. I want the band to get out and play some shows. Um, so I'm hoping that, uh, that we get to do that. Man, I can't see. I feel like I should have. It's dark in here. Is it too dark? There's no real way to get any more light. If I went out there, yeah, see, I've got other office mates who are in the other area, you know, so you can't go out there. You guys can see me right now. I mean, you know. Uh, anyway, um, I have a bootleg of a band playing at a band called the King Snakes. They were called the King Snakes. Then re they released one album as the Snakes, and they played New Year's Eve 1990, and I gave the sound guy a cassette tape. Uh, two things just stunned half this crowd, 1990 and cassette tape. But I, I was alive in 90, I was a college student, and I gave a uh, cassette tape to the sound guy, and he gave me my one and only uh, soundboard bootleg of any band, and it's of the Snakes playing New Year's Eve. And to this day, every New Year's Eve, at midnight, I play their blues instrumental version of Alda Lang Syne uh, at midnight to usher in the new year. There you go. And the snakes. If you could find the snakes, um, why is my son calling me in the middle of my panel? Um, in the, uh, it's like news in the outside world on the podcast, only via telephone. Um, yeah, if you could find the CD of the snakes, uh, it's phenomenal. Hold on a second. Hold on a second. Just give me a second. Hey, Fletch, I'm doing a, a panel. What's up? I can't. No, you can't. I gotta go. You gotta try mom because I'm live doing a panel right now. People are staring at me on the phone, wondering why I'm on the phone. So just just call call the home phone. Okay. Bye. Love you, buddy. Bye. That's Fletch. Um, okay. Yeah, it's Fletch. Uh, let's see. Um, what was I saying? Oh, the snakes. Oh, I'm gonna show you this. Uh, because I think it's worth. Okay, here's, I'll show you in in interest of in showing you what I what I'm listening to right now. What I just here's what I just purchased. I just purchased that Emma Fitzpatrick's record. Oh boy, is she talented! If you don't have Emma Fitzpatrick, she sings with me on Jackson and Living at Night on the album. She's one of the original Dick Jr. and the Volunteers. She's one of the original Volunteers. She also co-wrote a song for that album called Going Straight, and that song we wrote with Zach Ross and myself, and that song ended up on an episode of Supernatural. So get her record. But in, in the meantime, I'm gonna pull this up because I think it helps as a reference. Um, let's see. Ah, stop. Um, I'm gonna see if you can see this cover. I think it helps to see the cover. So there you go. If you ever see the snakes, that's the snakes album cover, and it's phenomenal, phenomenal band. Anyway, uh, go back to my questions here. Um, all right, little bit. Uh, what was Val F says? What was your reaction when you first got the script for Mystery Spot? Well, that was 1974, Val. I don't remember. Um, yeah. Uh, I, listen, anytime I got a script for Supernatural, I was stoked because it meant I was on the, um, uh, I was uh, going back to the show. And uh, I think doing the show, especially then before I was heavily involved in the convention circuit, it was just such a treat, such a great group of people and such a great and unique character that, you know, whether it be the first time I did the show or any time thereafter, every time I got an opportunity to do it, was great because it's just unlike any kind of guest spot you get in television. In, in television, you get 
you know, I'm the creepy bad guy, or I'm the, you know, hamstrung father who whose wife was murdered in this episode of some creepy cop show, whatever. Point is, you don't get guest star roles like this. This guest star role of the trickster then become the gate became Gabriel and then Loki, unlike anything else. So anytime I got an opportunity to play the character, I was super excited. Uh, still, still love being involved with the show. The fact that I get to direct it, you know, icing on the cake. Um, somebody, Martina Spring says, I love your directing style. Any new projects? Thank you. And no, the industry is shut down. But what I did do, I, I still have one episode of Supernatural that has yet to air, but that I have shot. And I have two episodes of Lucifer that I have directed, but that have not been released. So you have Dick Jr. directing opportunities for viewing coming up um, in the whenever the hell those things come out. Probably the fall. I mean, I'm not sure what's going to happen with the rest of these shows finishing up, but whenever production gets back in gear and people can finish their shows, uh, you'll get to see me uh, behind the camera for Lucifer twice and for one more Supernatural. I will have directed four Supernaturals in season 15, which is amazing. It's just been an amazing, amazing journey, amazing experience. Um, what can I say? You know, I have, st I have stuff here that's like, from Supernatural. Uh, I'll, give you a little, I'll give you a little tour of the crap on my desk. Fun? You can't tell me you don't want to see it because I can't hear you. Here's one. See if anybody recognizes what this bad boy's from. Huh? Anybody? No? Nobody recognizes it? Ernest Goes to Camp. This was the uh, rap present from Ernest Goes to Camp, which is why it says Ernest Goes to Camp on the back. Um, I still have that. I anybody's watch anybody watch the show Supernatural? Uh, Supernatural. There was an episode. I think it was called Optimism, and uh, um, Jensen and Alcal go to a diner to do some research on a on a suspect, and there's a lot of roosters in the diner. A lot of images of roosters on the wall and statues of roosters around. A lot of kitschy rooster stuff. And that's because Jerry Wanick is hilarious. That would be funny to lean in. Because there's there some roosters in the joint when we went to scout the location. And we're like, oh, we should keep the roosters. That's fun. So we did. We uh, kept the roosters, added a ton more roosters, and then named for the show, the episode, named it Dick's Red Rooster Diner. And I got to keep, uh, I got to keep one, of the, uh, one of the mugs, Dick's Red Rooster Diner. One of the perks of being Dick is you get to keep the swag with your name on it. Um, let's see what else I got here. I got this is old school. I mean, this is old. This is from Nashville, Tennessee. Back when Opryland wasn't a giant hotel and mall, but when it was a theme park. Somebody gave me this. This is a <laughs> what you used to get served a soda in when you went to. Opryland, a boot. I, I I don't think that's from my actual youth. I think somebody gave it to me years later. There you go. This is a pencil cup made by one of my made by Fletcher when he was in preschool. There you go. Um, let's see what else we got. This I bought at this pub back when I was doing Band of Brothers. It was near the Albert was near where we lived during that shoot, and so I have that. And along with that, I bought from the 101st Airborne store before I made Band of Brothers my own Easy Company mug. And now you're thinking to yourself, Rich has a lot of mugs. You're right, I do. Uh, I was, um, it's kind of time to clean things out. Anyway, there it is. Easy Company. 506. Scream and Able. There's that one. Let's see what else I got here. This one, this is old. Uh, this one, I, this is not mine. I, my buddies and I stole it because I thought it was so cool. Uh, Skywalker Sound. Skywalker Sound, the old uh, industrial light and magic up in Northern California where George Lucas does all his stuff, which is now, you know, more Oscars come out of that place than any other joint. And it's where we did sound for North Beach. 
and where I did sound for America 101. But that's from the North Beach days. We got and there's my North Beach poster. See, I got a North Beach poster up on the wall. North Beach, right there. The movie, first movie I ever directed. I'm in it. Uh, let's see. Yeah. That's me right there, rock star. And there's Jim Hanna, who played Dr. Goldfarb in Kings of Con. There's the machete. That's how I met her, J.C. Hayes. And then uh, there you go. There, there it all is, North Beach. Poster here in my room. Um, let's see, what else? Oh, well, you know, some swag made by some of you fine folks, Kings of Con. And Kings of Con. These are my travel mugs. So you have a, a veritable plethora of mugs. I like fluids. And then here is a uh, photo. This is the real guy, Skip Muck. This is the guy I played in Band of Brothers. See that? Sergeant Skip Muck. I keep him on my desk to keep me in balance, to remind me what really matters in life. Because you get bogged down by the crap, and then you take a look at a young man who volunteered for the military during one of America's most tumultuous times and died in the service of his country, and it kind of makes all of your problems seem like piddly bullshit. So if anybody out there is a member of the armed services, Thank you. If you were a member, if you are a member, if you're going to be a member, if you are related to a member, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, and thank you to anybody you are related to who's also doing the same or anybody you're friends with who's doing the same. It is uh, a hero's calling. And, you know, if you are involved in the medical field and if you are involved in whether you're a doctor, scientist, working in a lab, or cleaning up floors in the hospital, I don't care, you're doing... The Lord's work. I really, really appreciate everything you're doing. It's awesome. You're helping this country stay safe and battle this invisible enemy. If you're delivering anything in the, in the world, food, gear, supplies, pizzas, it doesn't matter. You're out and about working. Thank you. Thank you for doing what you're doing. I really appreciate it. If you're in the Postal Service, and hey guys, buy stamps, you know? Let's support the Postal Service. The Postal Service was there way before UPS was around, way before... FedEx is around. Postal Service has been doing what they've been doing, and uh, let's not let them fold under this great weight. Um, so do what you can to support those folks. I know times are tight, money's tight, so you know, use their services for what you need their services for, and that will actually suffice. Buy stamps, mail a letter, write to your grandma, do some things instead of an email. Write a couple of letters. First, of, first of all, it'll be really fun for people to get stuff in the mail during these weird times. Secondly. You get to drop a few cents in the coffers of the United States Postal Service. Uh, but if you're in the, if you're UPS, you're FedEx, you're any outsourced delivery company, thank you. If you're doing anything out there, grocery clerks, truck drivers, stocking shelves, anything. I say it a lot, but I mean it. I really appreciate it because uh, your work is valuable. Um, okay, now I should go back to, go back to a uh, actual question. Uh, Brittany. At least slowing down on the questions. Um, okay. Uh, okay. Deffy Normalcy asks, any advice for a first time or planning a trip to Nashville once all this pandemic stuff is over with? Yes, I do have advice. Um, I'd go to Hatch Show Print, which is a legendary print shop. does wood car printings of concert posters and advertisements and has been around forever since the 1800s and it's now based in the lobby of the country music hall of fame it's such a cool place make an unbelievable art you can buy a bunch of stuff from them and in fact they did the cut the album art for dick jr and the volunteers first record um but they are phenomenal it's americana art once you go in and see it you're going to realize oh my gosh i've seen that forever well go check it out see them doing it in real time in real life uh, and Go to, the, go to Acme Feed and Seed, which is on Broadway, at the corner of Broadway and 2nd Avenue, right near Riverfront Park. When I was a kid, it actually was a feed and seed, and now it's a three-level bar with all kinds of memorabilia and Americana art in it. A lot of old, old souvenirs from old recording studios are in there, and it's a really, really cool place to grab a beer and walk around and look at all the stuff, and then go to the top and look at the view of downtown and the stadium. and It's great. All up and down Broadway. Go to Tootsie's Orchid Lounge, Robert's Western World, The Stage, all great bars. Tootsie's Western World, 
I mean, sorry, Tootsie's Orchid Lounge is legendary, and it's right near the Ryman. Uh, it's where people who were performing at the Ryman would sneak out the back door of the Ryman and go over to Tootsie's and get hosed and go back and perform. And they go back to Tootsie's and play again on that stage after the Ryman was over, after the Grand Ole Opry was over. So that's a great thing to check out. And per, my personal favorite restaurant, um, I go to Charcoal Cowboys uh, uh, Barbecue Restaurant because that's my brother-in-law's place. Um, and I'd go to Jimmy Kelly's. It's a steakhouse that is my favorite place in Nashville. It's Nashville's oldest restaurant. It's in a house and it just does a damn good martini and a damn good steak. So, Jimmy Kelly's. There you go. And then go check out some bluegrass at uh, the Station Inn. You don't think you like bluegrass, maybe? Maybe you're like, I don't like bluegrass. Go see bluegrass live. You'll like bluegrass. Um, those players are amazing. Anyway, there's some Nashville tips for you. All right, so I'm going back to the uh, thing here. Um, let's see. Well, this is a weird one. Uh, well, it's from Krista. Hey, Rich, my German friend asked me to show show you show us your socks. Oh, you want to see my socks? Oh, well, that's weird. Glad I wore socks. Um, all right, I'll show you my socks. Uh, I gotta I get my pants. They're not that great. They're just uh, navy blue socks, but they got a like, little star pattern in there. You probably can't see because of the um, some of the lighting is not that great in here. Let's see, I'll, I'll do a little flashlight on my sock. That way you can really, really get the full experience. Let's see, ta -da! Light on Rich's sock. Can you see that? Is there sparkles or is that showing up? I don't know. Um, anyway, there's my sock. <sighs> Krista, have another pint. All right, uh, hold on a sec. Um, let's see. What's your favorite thing about directing Lucifer? From James Winchester. That's so funny, James. Winchester is the last name of the characters on the show Supernatural. That's crazy. Um, yeah, my favorite thing about directing Lucifer. I, it, it, there's a lot to love about that show. It's a great group of people. I got lucky that the show I got to direct after Supernatural, Supernatural being my first network series to, uh, to direct, I got lucky that um, that Lucifer was number two because Lucifer is such a great group of people, such a fun crew, such a talented crew, and then, of course, headed up by a cast that's just so fun. I mean, that show does a great job of balancing the drama and the humor. does such a masterful job doing that. And there's some people in there, Kevin Alejandro, I think Kevin Alejandro is funnier than Kevin Alejandro thinks Kevin is. I think he's hilarious. And every time he does a take, I just burst out laughing. And at a certain point, I think he thinks I'm, I'm jerking his chain. Because he's like, dude, it's not that funny. But it is. He's so subtle. He's so good. Um, Tom Ellis, obviously, phenomenal to work with. And Lauren German is just a crack up, man. I mean, she is just a laugh riot. Uh, it's, you know, Rachel Harris. Everybody, everybody's great. They're, they're all super funny, super nice people. It's a collaborative show. They are all, DB's great, Amy's great. I mean, they all have just been so welcoming to me. Leslie Ann, you know, they, they like to give me a hard time, but at the same time, welcome me into the family and, and, and listen to my ideas and, and, and let me be a part of the collaborative process. I just love it so much. And, you know, Ildi and Joe, who are the showrunners of that show, were so continue to be so creative and gracious and welcoming to new faces and talent on that show. It's just, it's just been a great experience. I've now directed three episodes of that show and, um, I love it. I, I love it. I have loved every, every second of, of that experience. Such a nice crew too. Um, all right, let me look at my phone. Um, nobody's baby now asks me, What's the first thing you want to do once the quarantine is over? Uh, besides visiting family and friends. Hmm. Well, that's interesting. I have a unique, I don't know, everybody's got their own experience with this quarantine. And if you know somebody who's sick, if you've lost somebody, if you 
are sick yourself. I'm so sorry. And that is horrific. And, and hopefully this country and this world is, are, are finding a path through the, the mire here to get us out to the other side. So economically it's difficult if you have a business that slowed down, if your job is on hold, if you lost your job, you've been furloughed, whatever. There are a lot of reasons why this is a very scary and sometimes for certain people horrific experience. Um, the flip side is I'm getting to spend a lot of time with my family, for me personally. And that's great because I've been on the road a lot. So I'm looking at the silver lining here. It doesn't mean I don't get cabin fever and it doesn't mean that I don't want this to be over as soon as humanly possible. But while I'm stuck in it, I'm making lemonade out of lemons. The lemonade being I, I, I haven't gotten this much quality time with my kids in years because I've been on the road. Every job I do, except for Lucifer, is out of town. Every convention, Supernatural, everything. Independent movies I've made, all been out of town. So this has been great to be at home with my boys. I'm their teacher. No joke. I'm, I'm the teacher. My wife is still working. And so she goes into the garage to make phone calls and, and do her emails and stay connected in her world. And I, my full-time job is getting the curriculum for the boys and overseeing its execution. Now for the older boys, they're a little more involved with their teachers on screen, but my youngest is a second grader and it's me and him. He checks in with his teacher three times a day, but it's, it's Frank and dad doing second grade stuff all day. And I, honestly, it's awesome. I'm going to miss it when it's gone. I will be glad and the boys will be glad to go back to their schools and see their buddies. But I'd be lying to tell you there won't be a little bit of a pinch in my heart, uh, watch them go away because it has been a phenomenal moment in my journey as a parent to get this window with the boys and to take a negative and make it a positive. And their attitude has been phenomenal. Their effort has been phenomenal with school and understanding the socialization restrictions. And it's just been a great bonding experience for us. So what am I looking forward to? I don't know, because I'm so in the middle of this right now. Um, and enjoying time with my wife and not going to airports and it's a lot that we are able to take and make work for us right now. Um, I think what I'll miss, what I look forward to the most is socializing with other adults, quite frankly, other peers, other couples that we haven't seen in a while that we can, you know, FaceTime, we FaceTime with family members, we FaceTime with, uh, neighbors, but obviously that's not the same. So, you know, I think. I think it'll be fun to go to a restaurant and sit and have a meal with another couple and enjoy live banter with other adults. I think that's what I look forward to. Um, all right, let's see. Uh, let's see what I got here from uh, New York, Brittany. Uh, I've got a question about Driven. Regina M, info on Driven, please. Uh, that is the independent movie I made uh, as an actor. It's such a great movie. Um, and Glenn Payne, Casey Dillard are the filmmakers behind it out of Tupelo, Mississippi. And I believe I found out from them online that they, they got, they got it released, uh, coming up here in June. They're just going to be out and out and about. I assume that means digitally available on platforms near you. So watch for Driven, super fun movie, super fun. And, and, you know, follow me on Instagram and, and Twitter, and, uh, I will retweet and repost their messages about that so we can... Um, keep you up to speed on what's going on there. Um, one other thing I have on my desk, I think probably a lot of business people have on their desk or creative people have on their desk because I think, I think it became something that everybody needed at one point and now people lean on it for either emotional support, for bouncing ideas, for for whatever, I think I think it's become a, a critical element in most places of business and places of creative uh, creative thought, and that's obviously you know what I'm talking about, Ned Flanders. Um, all right, let's see who, who else who, what else we got. Um, how is it having Matt Cohen shadow me? Oh, that was great. Matt Cohen shadowed me because Matt Cohen, um, 
Matt Cohen directed an episode of Supernatural, episode 15 this season. Uh, Matt Cohen and I are great friends, and so to have the opportunity to work with Matt up in Vancouver, which we've never done, and we were never on an episode of Supernatural together, we were never, I never directed him, um, the only time we worked together was Mama Bear, I guess technically, when he directed me. Uh, so, shadowing, even though shadowing we're not necessarily working together, but we're both working, and we're together, so... That was awesome, and I and you know he's such an eager uh, and upbeat dude with so many creative wheels spinning, and just a great guy to hang out with. Man, it was it was great. We had a blast. Uh, great guy to have dinner with after a day of shooting or a day of prepping. And right after we finished that, he started doing a movie for Hallmark. So then he just moved hotels and was still in Vancouver. And so you, I finished shooting, and I go see Matt, and we still have a cocktail. It was great. I got real used to that and spoiled so that the next time I went up to make Supernatural, the fact that it was matless was depressing. Uh, I can't wait to see his episode. I haven't seen any of anything about it. I haven't seen any shots or anything, but I'm sure it's phenomenal because he's a talented guy. And I'm thrilled that when it came time for him to do his shadowing, I was the guy he picked because, because it's a challenge being the guy people are shadowing. It sort of raises your game. You have to raise your game yourself and then I think it uh, it was fun watching Matt process the process. So it's going to be it's going to be great watching him develop as a director in the years to come. And I was glad I was there when it started. Um, okay, let's see. Uh, Hillywood Squad, what do you miss the most about conventions right now? I miss the camaraderie with the gang. I miss uh, shooting the breeze with. Borja, Norton, Moran, and Benedict in the green room before we start the day. Um, I, remit, I, I miss hanging with that exact same group at night when we all arrive and we all grab a, a bite to eat and maybe a pint right before we get the show started the night before. That's always super fun. And, you know, my favorite part of the conventions tend to be the mornings every morning when we get up and start the show because we're just, you know, five dudes making crap up and it's so fun and so freeing and so creative and they're all such talented guys they're all such good uh showman stage presence is um rob obviously sort of being spearheading the whole thing but i mean great improvisers norton billy and mike funny dudes man creative guys their ideas are great and we just and what happens in real time on stage which is never planned is great and we just get out there and not crap around and see where it lands and it's fun it is fun every now and then somebody will ask me about a specific moment they're like oh remember when that happened and i can honestly tell them no i don't because i don't because it all happens in real time and then we leave the stage and we go whoa that was nuts and then we're on to the next thing uh so god bless youtube for these things to exist and so I can relive some of these moments when they pop across my screen because they are rare and they're wonderful and I get to do it with an exceptional group of guys. Um, all right, let's see what's uh, going on here. Uh, do I have a favorite uh, memory, favorite moment part of Kings of Con? Um, not so much uh, because I enjoyed the whole thing. I enjoyed the whole process. And I still am in touch with that cast. I'm still in touch with, you know, Tina Dinsmore, now Tina Bell, and Ellie, and the, the crew that helped us make that show. Mark Evans, the DP, and I are still good friends. Obviously, the actors and I are still friends because you guys see us all together. But it, uh, it was a great experience. I think my only sadness is we didn't get to do more. But uh, what, a, what an awesome, awesome journey that was. What an awesome experience. Um, Man, let's see. These things just go real fast. Please stop spamming with the same question. Okay, I will stop spamming with the same question. I don't, I don't really understand what that means. Um, let's see. Uh, blah, 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 blah. Oh, I'm glad I'm not epileptic. There's a lot. Hold on a second. I'm going to go back to uh, Brittany because I think Brittany's got a better handle on this whole thing. Uh, oh, do I find myself, Jana Knowles wants to know, do I find myself grazing in the kitchen more often than usual? No, because I've had to put grazing restrictions on the children, because those mofos will eat 24-7 if I let them. 
the biggest mistake I ever made. I mean, and I've made mistakes. I've made mistakes. Um, the biggest mistake I ever made was uh, introducing my sons to sushi. That is a financially crushing decision I made years ago when they were little. I wanted to be sure they enjoyed some of the foods I enjoyed. Well, my kids eat anything. They eat anything. If it stands still, they'll take a bite out of it. And so they love sushi now. And anytime we would go to sushi, which obviously we can't do now, but when we would, it's a, it's a monstrous bill that comes at the end because they eat like horses. I now take them like, I, mean, I now feed them before we go to sushi so they are full. And they still eat a normal portion of sushi because uh, it's just, it's just going gonna, gonna to break the bank otherwise. Consequently, the grazing, because we can't just hop down to the grocery store now, right? I mean, I can't just like go, oh, we're out of this box of whatever. I'll just go get one. So we have to be more diligent and more uh, regimented with what we do food-wise. So I've had to tamp down the grazing with the boys. It's very specific times. And we, my wife, who's, uh, you know, deserves some kind of award for dealing with us all, uh, puts out healthy snacks every morning on the cutting board. And that's what the boys can snack on. And so you're not in the mood for a radish, tough darts, that's your choice. And they, they've gotten on board with it. So they only snack with what we put out. And it's funny, if you can't graze, if you can't go for the crap, you realize, eh, not that hungry. So I haven't, I'm not a giant radish fan either. So like I minimally snack and the rest of the time I, I just kind of deal with that. So no, I think the grazing has actually gone down uh, in this COVID time. Um, hey, something else that might be interesting for you to see. Uh, I'll be right back. All right, this is kind of fun. Um, this is from Comic-Con. The first Comic-Con Robin and Nick and I ever hosted for um, Supernatural. We decided to come out with some props. There's some other props around here somewhere, but anyway, we decided to come out with some props. And uh, this little critter made an appearance. Hello. I can't remember the character's name, but Mark Shepard. It's a very funny bit with Mark Shepard and this uh, little rascal. And if you haven't seen it, Google Comic Con whenever the hell that was, the first year. And um, I keep this guy, Rob and I keep this little rascal, in this mug, which shows Rob as a zombie. It's Rob Zombie with the gopher or the hamster in it. Here we go. Um, yeah, I enjoy that. <sighs> also, if you're a Kings of Con fan, um, Here's Rob's styrofoam head. Oh, hey everybody. How's Rich doing? Is he doing all right? Hey, I just leaned in to, hey, it's me, Rob, just leaned in to say hey. Hi, guys. Uh, that was Rob's uh, styrofoam head. You're welcome. All right, let's see. Go to my list of questions here. What's weird is not being able to hear anything. That's that's like strange. Um, somebody asked me if I took a souvenir from my first directing gig, which I assume they mean my first directing gig on uh, Supernatural, because I had, my first directing gig for money was directing commercials. But I, hey, here's a here's a commercials piece of commercial uh, paraphernalia. It's kind of a souvenir. This is not a commercial. I was. Uh, I directed this is one I was in, but it's a uh, it's a um, it's a can you see it? It's it's me and Snoop Dogg. Uh, that back when I was doing the Pepsi commercials, and Snoop was pretending to make seven layer dip for a Super Bowl party. We did the whole thing in front of a green screen, and they put a kitchen set in behind us. But that's uh, that's uh, here's Truly and Snoop. He's a tall dude. Um, All right, let's see. Go, to the, go back to the questions. Mm -hmm. You know, it's interesting to, to like, do this in a bubble. You don't hear any 
boos or laughter or boos or laughter. Um, applause. It's very interesting. Very strange. Um, somebody, asked, somebody asked earlier what I'll, you know, what I look forward to when this COVID experience is finally over. A live audience. I look forward to a live audience. That's what I look forward to. Um, Dragon Fairy asked me, how closely uh, do you work with the writer of an episode when you are directing? Close. Uh, Supernatural, I've become friends with everybody, so we're in constant contact. But even though I weren't friends with them, the way the process works is, you know, they send me the script and I start going through the script and then any concerns I have, I take directly to the writer and or showrunners to discuss options or get clarification or that kind of thing. But inevitably, they... I've developed a really good rapport with Bob Barons and Steve Yaki and um, Brad uh, Buckner and Eugenie, Ross Lemming, and the other writers on the show, Meredith Glenn, so that when I do have one of their episodes, we can easily discuss what I think needs to be discussed or what they think needs to be discussed and make changes accordingly. Uh, it's been a real delight with one of everybody. And then uh, over at Lucifer, all three of my episodes, just by luck, were written by the same writer, Jen Amada. Um, and then this last one was co-written by Jen and Julia. And so, but I've worked with Jen three times. And on Lucifer, the writer is with you the whole time. So, Supernatural, not so much. They're back in Los Angeles, you're up in Vancouver. And so your communication is all email or phone call or text. Uh, but there's a lot of that going back and forth uh, all through the production. At least all through prep. Uh, but, but Jen, I mean, Jen and I were attached to the hip um, the whole time. I'm going to find a picture of me and Jen attached to the hip. Because um, she's honestly the bee's knees, and we had a, a great experience. So hold, hold on one second. I'm going to drag up a photo. Um, let's see. When did I do that? All right, I'm going to find a photo of Jen Amata to show how attached to the hip we are. Because we are attached to the hip. There we are. Two people. One hip. Jen Amata, Rich Spate. Uh, that was the last night of shooting, the last episode I did. And it was uh, fantastic. I want to find a picture of Julia now. Because Julia and I were also attached to the hip. And here's Julia uh, kissing a photo of, sorry, a painting of Jen Amata. That's how close they are. She carries around with her a painting of Jen, and every now and then just sort of blows it a kiss. Um, anyway, they're, they're phenomenally talented people. It was a phenomenal experience. Um, and we work together constantly because we're together constantly. We're together from day one of prep all the way through the last shot on the last night so that anything of concern they bring to me, anything of concern I bring to them, and we make adjustments in real time, which is different than the supernatural experience. But, but nonetheless, they're both equally rewarding and equally uh, reliant on a great rapport between director and writer. Um, all right, let's see. Uh, what do we got here? Mm -hmm. ah. So let's see. Sophia Tomzak asked me, did you know that the trickster was Gabriel when he started playing the character? I still don't know that that's the case. Um, no, I did not know that. I had no idea. I had no idea that that was, uh, I didn't know, no idea that I'd be doing more than one episode. I thought I would be doing one episode and that'd be it. You know, I was, I was hired to play a janitor who ended up having magical powers. And it turns out, uh, I was the trickster and that was awesome. Let's see what the hell this is. What is this? Ah. Uh, scene from Supernatural. Um, 
Yeah, it was, uh, it, it, it's, everything in Supernatural has been a surprise. I didn't know my character would come back. I didn't know my character would be becoming another character. I didn't know eventually they'd bring out Loki. I never knew anything. They don't tell me a damn thing. They just hand me a script and say, go. Um, which has been awesome, because then I'm as surprised as you are, only sooner. All right, let's see. What else we got here? Um, uh, what's your favorite part of the podcast? That's from Emma Shane. My favorite part of the podcast is the sound effects Rob puts in later. I think it's super, super funny, um, because I don't know what they're going to be. Rob uh, puts those things in after the fact, um, so that we make, ah, we make... I make a comment about, or he makes a comment like, oh, we should do sound here. And it's part of the show the way we say it. But it's not until Rob gets the tapes and gets the tracks and, and starts putting them together. Because my trap's like separate and his trap is separate. It's not until Rob starts putting all that together that we then get, uh, that he gets to like work his magic and the, the, the little news of the world and i mean he had one last week that made me laugh out loud when i was listening to it it's like a creepy organ i don't know he does funny stuff he's obviously enjoying himself uh and and i enjoy hearing what he what he does after the fact it's really great he's he's <laughs> he's at the top of this creative game right now using music and singing and comedy talking and he's just you know it's great it's good that it's good that one of us knows how to do that crap i know how to do the film editing and the shooting he knows how to do the audio stuff and he's doing great with it and it's super fun to Listen to what he comes up with because it's always very funny. Um, what kind of mask are you guys wearing? You know what I wore today? I went with. Yeah, I'll show you. I went with uh... El Bandito. This is my. Uh, this is my. This is what I had to go with today. Before you start judging me, because you're like, ah, oh, it's not blocking that much crap. I know. I was walking from the car to this room. I, I just. Yeah, I went minimally. So I could take it off. Um, but yeah, I'm going with that. Hope you guys are all wearing your masks when you're supposed to. And um, I know it's a frustrating time, but uh, you know, hopefully we're all doing what we can do to keep everybody safe, ourselves and other people included. All right, let's see. New Um Let's see. Ten minutes left. That's not a question. Uh, let's see. Somebody just said Spider-Man. That makes no sense. Um, what's it like working with Jensen? Um, it's like working with Jared and Jensen. It's like working with pure light on either side of you. Absolute glory. Physical perfection. And a smell. A smell that launched a thousand ships. Fresh as daisies. They don't need shower. Showers be damned. It's Jared and Jensen. They're not human. They're more than human. They're Hugh. Man. More man than Hugh. Uh, it's great. They're good dudes. Uh, that was a all. Oh, that was a lie. The truth is, they're good dudes. Really good dudes. Hard workers. Good men. Funny guys. Great guys to call friends, and certainly phenomenal guys to watch work and to work with and uh, work alongside. So, you know, feel very fortunate to have landed on a show with two lead actors who are not jackholes, because a lot of actors, especially in their position, are jackholes. They are not, and that is refreshing, and they are friends of mine and friends of all of ours. Any relationship you see play out on stage is genuine. We all get along, we are all buddies, we all have great relationships and, uh, and have enjoyed a decade of traveling together on conventions and, and bonding with each other on stage and bonding with each other off stage. They're good dudes. Jared and Jensen are good, good men. And so is Misha. And you know what? So is Al Cal, who was a lovely addition to the show. And that's a tough spot, man, to be brought into a show that's been on its feet for, at that point, 13 solid years. And you're brought in as this new guy to be heavily involved in the story. You don't know anybody. You were a zygote when the show started. But Al Cal's great, man. He's a great guy, great actor. Love working with Al Cal. Love directing Al Cal. Love sitting around shooting the breeze with Al Cal. He's just a good man. I like him a lot. Um, and you, I don't know if you know this, but his code name is Scorpion. Let's see. Um, announce a last question if you can. Of course I can. It's my thing. Um, all right, let's see. Last question. I'll try to do a couple here. 
Uh, what's your favorite all-time role you've ever played? It's impossible for me to say because I love acting so much that every time I get an opportunity to do it, I love it. I've been blessed to do great roles in big projects and great roles in small projects. And I've had small roles that I loved and I've had big roles that I loved. I just, I get to do for a living the job that I dreamt of doing as a kid. So I have no complaints. I, 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 love, I love everything I get to do. Um, if Gabriel were to come back uh, for the current fight, would he be fighting for Chuck or humanity? I don't know. I don't care. But I'll tell you this much. If Gabriel did come back, the one thing I would tell him is, for the love of God, don't fight one of your brothers. You die every time. Every time. Lucifer, hey, I got you, buddy. No, you don't. Uh, Michael, you got served. Did I? Oh, no. So Gabriel needs to either hone his fighting skills elsewhere when it comes to his brothers. He's not a bad fighter for the other fights. He's pretty good with the Nordic gods, good with the swords, and, you know, pretty handy. But with his own brothers, he really shits the bed. Maybe that's a lesson to all of us. Don't fight with family. Let's not, during this valuable time, during this fragile time, let's not fight with family because you'll only end up with an angel blade or archangel blade buried in your torso. Um, let's see. What else we got here? I guess that's, you know, symbolic for the rest of us. Um, let's see. Last question. Brittany, you're not giving me a last question. Uh, I love France. Yes, I do. I love France. Um, what's with the beard? It's uh, hair that grows from the face on a lot of men. And in my case, uh, it's doing just that. And I, it's kind of called a COVID beard if you want, but it's a beard. It's something I'm doing. Uh, a show of support slash rebellion. Besides the fact that I usually have a beard anyway, so it doesn't really look any different than the usual me. Blah, blah, blah. Um, all right. Ooh, take a souvenir to that. We're the writer to that. For the podcast, a minute of our day. Um, hmm. Let's see. I know you've given me a lot, Brittany. You know, don't take that tone with me. Ah, Brittany. It's, it, I, you, it's moving so fast here. You love me. Well, thank you. Um, do I have a dog? I have a dog. Dog named Luna. Cat named Turtle. Uh, I posted a picture of the cat staring creepily, creepily at me through the window. Go back to the Instagram. Check out that picture of Turtle. I mean, Turtle looks like he's planning my demise. He's staring at me through the window. Very creepy. But greatest cat of all time. Greatest dog of all time. Luna and, uh, and Turtle. Um, uh, it's down to a minute. It's going to be the end of my time. Let me tell you something, guys. I appreciate so much you taking this time to do this unusual thing with me. Um, it's great connecting with you guys again. Is this the new permanent normal? I don't think so. But it's the new current normal, so I'm glad we were able to do something fun and still connect and still find a way to banter back and forth. I uh, appreciate everything you're doing out there for each other, for this nation and the nations that you might live in. Let's beat this virus, and we can do that together as a unit. And there is no better unit than the supernatural family. So I know we can be leaders in this whole process. Uh, get out and get involved in ways that you can safely. Support your neighbors in the way you can safely. Support your community.